Hey everyone, Stefan here. I'm at the awesome Cathlopotl plank house here on the banks of the Columbia River. And I thought it would be uh, interesting to talk about that today because I find them and the story of the people who built them, the Chinook people, absolutely fascinating. Before I get into it, I just want to point out that the Chinook people are currently going through some uh, very serious legal battles to be officially recognized by the federal government here in America. Uh, any attention and support you give to that, I'm sure would be greatly appreciated by them. So I've put a, a couple of links in the description linking to the Chinook Nation and any way you could help, should you so be inclined. Anyway, back to the uh, plank house. This is a, a new build, but it's a living house. It's still used by the Chinook people today for their ceremonies and community gatherings. And this style of house would have really dotted the Columbia River uh, before European arrival and uh, during the initial phases of contact between Native Americans and Europeans. By studying these houses archaeologically, by reading the uh, first-hand accounts of the first European travelers, and crucially by listening to the oral history of the Chinook people and other Native American peoples, we can really get an idea of how their civilization worked before European contact. And uh, to me, that's just absolutely fascinating, that window into that different culture, civilization. I always love that stuff. So plank houses have been built in this area for a good 3,000 years. And that's just what we know so far archaeologically. Who knows what the future may hold in that discovery. And it's really the, the basic social uh, unit of Chinook civilization. The house was really the sort of heart of their community, as, as it is for modern people. The Chinook people lived in villages consisting of several houses like this. This one would be about a medium-sized house. Archaeologically, we have evidence for plank houses that are 70, 90 meters in length, really substantial dwellings that would require a huge amount of effort and uh, mobilization of manpower to construct. They're absolutely fabulous things, so beautifully made. Lewis and Clark visited Cathlopotl in 1806, and they describe a village of consisting of 14 houses and a population between 900 and 1400 people. Now that was just one village out of 18 that they counted in the area. So the Chinook people were really able to sustain a, a very large population, at least 10,000 people. Considering that these people were not agriculturalists, they uh, hunted and fished and lived off the land. That's an absolutely astounding achievement and just goes to show how abundant the natural resources were and how efficient they were at collecting, processing and storing them so that this population could be supported 365 days of the year. Astounding achievement. So these houses are built out of cedar primarily. They sort of have a uh, middle column going down and then on either side two much shorter ones to support these huge roof beams, bloody mosquitoes, and uh, they would have cedar planking along the sides. The doorway would be oval and would often be placed uh, underneath or between the legs of an image of the representative of that house, the sort of community leader of that house. Now, in a house such as this, about 70 people would have lived inside. Each bunk would have really been a family grouping. They have some reconstructed bunks in there now, but they're much smaller than they would have been in the uh, one from that period, uh, just to create a more open space. But each bunk would have consisted of a family unit. Interestingly, there's some evidence that for at least some Chinook people, these houses were transportable. Sometimes the Chinook would live between summer and winter residences, and uh, that would probably consist of two sets of frames, the roof and side planking being transportable between the two buildings. That's not what happened all the time, but in the, the book that I've read about this, which is linked below, they suggest that that did happen in at least some cases, which again is really uh, an interesting adaptation to, the, uh, to your area, to your climate, to have this house that you can break down and move between two different locations. So the Chinook house was really the center of uh, food production and processing for the Chinook people. 
and uh, they really were able to do that on a vast scale and we have evidence for that both archaeologically and from uh, the accounts of European travelers and the Chinook themselves. Underneath these houses they would have had large storage pits to uh, safely keep their food out of the way and safe for the winter. What's interesting is the, not only the quantity of food that they stored, but also that none of these storage pits were alluded to in first-hand European accounts, suggesting perhaps that these were secret or, or at least not on display when the Europeans came through and, and visited these houses. Interesting to think about, they'd have probably been very wise to keep it secret. In the roofs of the building, they'd have hung fish and other meats to smoke and preserve. And there's one account from 1835, a chap named Nathaniel Wyeth, who visited a Chinook house and suggested there was at least four tons of food that he could see, particularly fish, uh, in the house. So they really were exceptionally good at gathering resources and processing them and storing them. Where you slept in a plank house also suggested your social status. So at the far end of the building, which was also the most active religiously and spiritually, where there are different representations of the chief and uh, grandfather and grandmother, perhaps spirits, I'm not 100% sure on that, but different representations of significant figures anyway. Uh, that would be where the chief slept and the highest status individuals. As you got closer to the door, further back through the house, uh, that would be for lower and lower status people and perhaps by the door would even be slaves. The Chinook did practice slavery to uh, some extent, but we're not sure whether the slaves stayed in the plank houses or if they slept in their other areas. It's hard to uh, identify archaeologically how that would break down. The presence of different hearth boxes also suggests different groups, perhaps different social groupings. At the Maya house, another plank house that was excavated nearby, there were two hearth boxes and one, the closest to the elite side, just really showed evidence for food consumption. The other larger hearth box towards the door showed a lot more evidence of sort of industrial processes. Their fires had temperatures that were so hot it could fuse bone and stone together, suggesting a lot of activity. There was also evidence of a lot of copper production and processing. And uh, all of this was absent from the hearth box closer to the elite side of the building, suggests that they kept some industrial processes separate from that side. However, that being said, archaeologically and from the Chinook themselves, we know they perhaps did not break down resources and uh, jobs in that we might think they did today. There isn't a super clear divide between what elite members of that community did and lower status individuals did. It seems that everyone played a part in different jobs. Interestingly, although we see some uh, specialization between houses, we don't really know how they tied into the wider economy very well. So, for example, there are some houses that show a lot of hide working, some that show a lot of stone working, some that show a lot of copper production. But it seems that every house did a little bit of everything, regardless of whether they had a specialty. And we don't really know how the, the wider economy uh, functions, although we do know that the Chinook were exceedingly enthusiastic traders, uh, plied the river and plied the coast with their trade. Perhaps some houses had specialties and they traded with others to form this much wider economic area. So that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about today. There's a lot more to uh, know about the Chinook people and their traditional culture. If you'd like to check that out, by all means, check out my uh, sources below or my primary source. And, uh, and again, as I said, check out the Chinook Nation and their current legal battles. As I said earlier, I'm sure any help and uh, attention given to them would be greatly appreciated. Over here, YouTube's gonna pick another video as it does of mine for you to watch. You can do that. You can leave a like, a comment, a subscribe. You can do all these things. It's a fascinating world. I hope you found that interesting. See you guys. I don't know if that was better or worse.